let's get started with our first uh, presentation. Uh, this will be done by Dennis and Cesar. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis and uh, his name is Cesar. So we are Android developers in KLM. Uh, uh, today we're going to introduce Kotlin to, for really novices. Uh, probably uh, on the workshops you will have more, in, more information, uh, deeper. So I'm going to start with uh, some information maybe with, which will be quite interesting. So Kotlin was uh, developed by JetBrains. The main development uh, team is in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, the, where does the name Kotlin come from? <laughs> team decided uh, to name it after an island, which is, uh, come on, work, yes, the Kotlin <laughs> island close to St. Petersburg. Um, like Java, was uh, named after Indonesian <laughs> island, though the programming language Java was perhaps named after the coffee. Um, so, uh, some facts about Kotlin. Uh, version 1 uh, was a stable version, was in, uh, developed and uh, released on February 15, 2016. Uh, after that, uh, version uh, JetBrains uh, uh, told that uh, this version will be uh, supported. After, after all versions after that one will be fully supported. And, uh, but uh, developers were not really enthusiastic with this at that time. Uh, it was like a okay Kotlin. What is the language? Uh, how for how long it will be supported? Uh, maybe in half a year or a year it will be dropped. So I'll definitely be using that language in my uh, small uh, projects, but no, not in my uh, corporate project or in my, at my work, etc. Because it's too dangerous. No one knew uh, how long it will be supported. But when Google announced the official support. For Kotlin, it was on Google I.O. 2017. Uh, it was like this. Everybody started learning Kotlin, using Kotlin everywhere. So after this uh, event, Kotlin became a trend. Uh, and now I think I'll give a word to Caesar for some more information. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so now you might be wondering, um, Yes, uh, so why should you use Kotlin? Um, and that is uh, a good question because maybe you're, you're already using some other language. Um, you're thinking, eh, you know, I'm good enough in this language, why should I use Kotlin? And it's mainly because you know, Kotlin is really good. It uh, allows you to write clean and concise code, and especially uh, since it's very interoperable with uh, Java, um, like 100% even, um, it's a good thing that you. Um, Sorry, good luck. Um, it does so many things well. Uh, since it's been developed by uh, IntelliJ, um, <coughs> they know they know their stuff. They make, like, in my opinion, the best IDE in the world. Um, so what they did is just they looked at other languages as well, and they were like, okay, what does this language? What does make this particular language awesome? Took that feature and tried to implement it in Kotlin the best way they could. Um, this is of course going to be shown in the demo that's going to be uh, with my, these guys over here. So, but also uh, a language is important for language to have something that uh, makes it unique, that um, really sets it apart from other languages. And for Kotlin, uh, those are two key things. Uh, the first are coroutines. It's basically uh, very lightweight threads. It allows for easy asynchronous programming. As a developer, you probably have been in the situation um, where you start shifting from that you're doing synchronous programming, which is easy operations, or your variables are there, simply adding numbers, yeah, uh, inverting a string, whatever. But then suddenly you're starting to do more complicated stuff. You're starting to do um, database queries. You're starting to do network calls. You're starting to do operations that take some time. And that's where um, asynchronous programming raises heads. And maybe maybe you have been in this situation, but um, <coughs> you can call it callback hell, sometimes already known. Um, this is where stuff gets really complicated. Um, stuff has been done to tackle these kind of problems. Maybe you have reactive programming, Rx. Um, 
that's a fantastic piece of software, fantastic stuff to use, but um, the complaints I hear about that the most is that the learning curve of that is very, very steep. Like, you can write beautiful uh, code in that, but um, before you get there, you're, it's, it's months and months of actual using it, training, uh, going to conferences, etc. So how does Kotlin tackle this? Um, <coughs> as you see there, there's a small block of code, it's like the most minimalistic way to define a method in Kotlin. And to go from uh, the easy synchronous world to the, the bit harder uh, asynchronous world, they try to make it as easy as possible, that it's, it goes as light as possible, and you sim they simply said, okay, you know what, we take this regular function, and <coughs> we simply add a keyword in front of it. And that's basically it, that makes it easy. Um, of course, I'm taking a lot of shortcuts here, um, but that's, that's it for asynchronous programming. Sorry, Yeah. isn't it just the same as async in uh, JavaScript? Also possible, yes. That's, that, that's what I said, that's, that's a very good point, because um, for Kotlin you're always going to have, uh, hey, I've seen this uh, in another language already, and that's, that's correct, because like I said, Kotlin tries to take a lot of awesome features from other languages which do stuff correctly and incorporate them. So yeah, that's a completely valid point. And the other stuff uh, that makes Kotlin unique is the big focus now, it's very recent, focus on multi-platform stuff. Um, in my opinion, this is very important because back in the day, um, like, like let's say the 1970s, 80s, when everything just started, a computer just meant that, a personal computer, a big monolith of hardware with a screen in your house. But nowadays we have, we have that, we have laptops, we have mobile phones, even my refrigerator knows what weather it is in California. Computers are nowadays, nowadays everywhere. So um, it should be so, so that you can support multiple platforms. It's very important nowadays. And where Kotlin started out as a language that started on the JVM, um, and now also uh, has, there's also now Kotlin JavaScript, which allows you to write Kotlin in the browser. And um, currently Kotlin native is in uh, version, I think, uh, 0.6, which means it's not uh, yeah, super stable yet. But it basically means that you can, as if you were writing a C program, like very basic stuff. So you can have a project which, um, yeah, has one shared code base, like let's say some logic, uh, just completely shared, some separate UI elements, and it can run on whatever device you want. And that's it, that's, uh, that's what makes Cosmo unique. Also, shameless plug for the uh, Android track. It's, uh, as I said, right over there. I'm gonna build a, a small chat app from scratch. <coughs> With, uh, in combination with, uh, with Android, Kotlin, and uh, Firebase. If you're interested, uh, please uh, join us back there. And then with this, I want to give the word to the next speaker. Hello. Oh, no. Steve Mayarno. All right. Loud, I guess. Can uh, everybody hear me? I think uh, it should be fine, right? Good. Bend it away from my face here. Thank you. See if it works. Does it? Yes. Oh, there we go. So the idea is that I'm going to be do a bit of live coding, and basically that's a recipe for disaster. So if it goes wrong, then uh, if you see me running, uh, don't follow me, I guess. Uh, the idea is to show a few of the features that Kotlin has to offer, and basically I want to offset it uh, uh, against uh, Java. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you use Java. Can I get a show of hands. So not less than half, I guess. So, but uh, are you familiar with the concepts of Java, I guess? Uh, or is it mainly JavaScript, but, uh, what I'm seeing here? Uh, yeah, basically what I wanted to show is that uh, uh, for Java, one of the, the, the problems that Java has, or a problem if you, if you see it that way, I guess, is that you usually have to have a class to have a method in it. So if you want to create a Hello World application, then you would have to create a class and put a main method in there. So one of the things that change uh, with Kotlin is that you can define a main method and let's say we want to make a Hello World uh, application, we can do that at top level. So what this means is that you don't have to specify classes anymore to, anymore to put your functions in. So basically they're bound to a package, and Kotlin will compile it back into a class, but you won't be able to, uh, uh, to deal, you won't have to deal with that. So that's pretty nice, but it doesn't just stop there. So you then just uh, don't, can, uh, you, uh, it doesn't stop with uh, uh, creating main methods here. What you can do is specify functions as well, so let's say I want to have a, a, a function that uh, says hello world. 
the syntax may be familiar to some people, I'm not sure if it's been, people are familiar with Scala. So the syntax for Kotlin takes a bit, <laughs> to borrows a bit from Scala. I think uh, if I remember it well, the Kotlin team was looking for a language to replace Java because they thought, thought it was way too verbose to write the software in. They looked at Scala, they thought it was a bit too complex at some point, and they decided to have a little bit more of a practical uh, language. So if you, if you take a look at this, Kotlin takes a lot of these uh, uh, elements from Scala, so the, the syntax is from Scala. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, of uh, borrowing there. So the methods are really concise, and you uh, can see if you offset this to Java, normally you would define the return type at the beginning. For Kotlin it's at the end, uh, basically it's the same, and everything is a function, so that's uh, everything is fun in Scala, is what they say, or uh, in Kotlin. <laughs> So yeah, that's a boring joke already. Uh, so let's say we want to return hello world, and if you can uh, check here, if I look at my main method, I can just call this hello world function directly. So I don't have to specify any classes, and I think that's a bit of a luxury, because you don't need to do that to write an application. So that's one of the things where, where, where Kotlin shines uh, uh, with regards to, uh, to Java. Now one of the other uh, key pillars of, uh, of uh, Kotlin is that you have immutability built in. So if you look at this, I have a main method again, and I have two specified uh, properties here. One is called immutable, which probably, as you guessed, is an immutable property, and one is mutable. So if you were to offset this in Java, you would have to leverage the final keyword. So uh, Java will make properties immutable when you use final. Uh, for Kotlin, they specify the keyword for it. So specify a property with the val keyword makes it immutable, and with var it makes it mutable. So if I were to write code behind this, saying I want to create a new va value, uh, uh, let's uh, call it uh, new, and I want to say, uh, oh sorry, I have to do it differently. If I take immutable and I wanted to assign a value to it, that's what I wanted to do, so new value. In this case, the compiler will complain and say, okay, values cannot be reassigned, so they're immutable. So that makes you really aware of what you're doing. So if you can write your code like this, you can make sure that your values are not being reassigned and uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's actually quite nice because it, it saves you uh, a lot of uh, bug hunting in some cases. Now, for mutables, of course, this is something that really works as well. Uh, for mutables, you can just reassign values. But it makes you uh, really uh, make a conscious choice when declaring a variable whether or not you want it to be mutable or immutable. Now, one of the other things you might see here is that if you declare a variable, is you define the type. So you have a colon and then you set the type for the, the, the value. But most of you will have seen that, okay, I'm assigning a string to it, so probably the property will be of type string. So it, it makes no sense to, to uh, be that verbose. So another thing that, that makes Kotlin very, uh, very good is that you don't have to specify types in these cases. So I can just declare variables like this without specifying the explicit type, and this will work. Now, you might want to uh, uh, see what, that, what the result is of... Uh, uh, um, of a certain assignment, so let's say well, I'm going to assign to a new uh, variable the immutable. I'm going to uppercase it, for instance, uppercase. So if you see this statement, you might wonder, so what, what type is NW going to be? Right? It doesn't, it's not really clear. Basically, if you know the, the API spec, then you will know that two uppercase returns a string. But there may be cases where you don't know this. And this is where Kotlin shines as well. One of the things that the Kotlin team found is that for Scala, it's really difficult to build tool support. Right, for, for different languages. For Java it's really easy because it's really restricted. So you can have, write uh, proper tools that help you along the way. For Scala it was a lot harder and they wanted to have a concise language with a lot of flexibility but also with good tool support. So one of the things you can do here is you can say in IntelliJ, which is a very good IDE, so if you don't use it yet, so uh, I would really suggest you start doing that. But you can specify that you want to show <coughs> local variable type hints. And if you assign that or if you, if you activate that, and IntelliJ will help you. I'm not sure if it's really readable here. But when you do these method calls, it will tell you what the inferred type will be for this uh, uh, property. So it's a, quite a nice feature to uh, support your coding uh, habits in uh, IntelliJ. So you don't have to do extra typing, but you still will know what your types are going to be. So another thing that's built into the language is null safety. I have this uh, example here. I define two values here. One is uh, nullable, so uh, it's of type string and it's never null, which is, uh, makes sense. And the second one is of nullable type, and in this case I have to specify the type, because I have to specify it as being nullable. And the question mark that's behind it specifies it as being nullable. The reason that this is built into the language is uh, that we have to interoperate with Java. One of the key features for Kotlin is also very good interoperability with Java, so all your Java frameworks will still work with uh, Kotlin. Um, 
so in order to deal with that, Java is typically not null safe. So uh, you have to specify this at some point. Generally, if you write your code uh, from scratch in Kotlin, then you would see this a lot less. Well, in order to write code that's less error prone, you can leverage this, right? So you have this, this nullable type. Let's say I want to assign uh, uh, this to a value again. So I want to uppercase this nullable type. Uppercase. What you can see here is it in first type again. That's nice. And it also gives me a compiler error. And why is that? I've specified this type as being nullable, so I cannot safely call any functions on this type. Could be null at any point in time. So Kotlin forces you to do something about that. And there's something you can do. So one of the things you can do is use the question mark operator, which basically says if the left hand side of this function is null, so if the nullable is actually null, then just return null in this case. So don't call to uppercase, and just return null. So this assignment will result in uppercase being null. And you can see that immediately the inferred type is suddenly a string question mark, so it's the, the, the null, nullable type of this. But this still takes the null further. So what, what else can you do? There's also another option that you can use. This takes the first part, which is the same. And we need to uppercase it. So we get the issue again. So it might be null, so I have to do something about it. But here, I can use the Elvis operator. I think, I'm not sure if people did Groovy at some point, but they will know this. And basically, this allows you to specify a default. So I can specify a string that says that it's null. <coughs> And now suddenly the inferred type is no longer null. So you can see here that now I've, I've removed the issue of a null pointer, or the, 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 the possible occurrence of a null pointer exception. And that's, that's quite nice. That's something you really can't do. So you have to really program defensively in Java. You have to really make sure that you don't uh, screw that up. And in this case, you can uh, yeah, work your way around it. So this is a quite clever syntax, easy to use and uh, easy to master. There's also another one that you can do. <laughs> this is the null safe assert. And this generally shouldn't do because anybody could guess what happens here? <laughs> this is the only exception in Java that has its own acronym, the null pointer exception, I guess. Uh, the idea here is that if you use the, the double uh, colon uh, uh, notation, is that you assert that the nullable never is null. You can use this when interoperating with Java. If you have functions where you are absolutely sure that nullable will never be null, but in the case that it is, it will throw the classic null point exception. So basically I named this parameter shooting foot because you should actually never do it. But it's there anyway for uh, the backwards compatibility. I have a last uh, example I wanted to show you, and that's how you can write really concise code. Because one of the things that, uh, that uh, the guys from JetBrains said, it's really difficult to write uh, compact code, expressive code, that's easy to read, easy to understand. Uh, in Java, you have to do a lot of work uh, around it. It's not really easy to read, not quickly to, uh, to understand. So, let's say I have this function, a two yes, no string. Anybody know what this does? Is it clear from the example? <coughs> so basically, this is what uh, we usually do as Java developers. We write all these extension functions, or this, the, these utility functions, basically, <laughs> that help us do uh, uh, our work. So let's say uh, yeah, we have a value here, yes or no. We say we put a boolean in there. <coughs> we call that as well. It's true. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm declaring a boolean, assigning the value true to it. Then I'm going to convert that to a string with this method. It should be yes or no. So if I run this, then I would hope that it actually does that. It would print yes. I didn't screw it up. Here it is, so happily working. <coughs> but if you look at it, this is also already, already a really verbose function, right? It's uh, a lot of lines and it doesn't really do anything. So that's where where Kotlin allows you to, to actually optimize. So one of the things you see here already is that we have two returns. So we're, we, we are repeating ourselves, we can uh, optimize that. Uh, in Kotlin you have an if statement, but it's actually an expression. So you can actually return directly from your if statement. Which means you can write your if statements like this where the last statement in your if statement will be the return time. So it saved you a little bit, right? So you can write this a little bit more compact. You're returning the result of your if statement directly. 
But you can also do that to take it a little bit further. Functions in, in themselves can be uh, expressions as well. So we can actually say we're going to return this directly. We have to remove the return. So it's a bit like an assignment. So this is already a little bit shorter, right? We're going to say this function is the result of this if statement, whether or not it's yes or no. But we can even do better. Because this if statement is is, uh, 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 has only uh, a string as a result type, so you can't have anything else, the type can be inferred. So Kotlin can also remove this. You can see that it's inferred again here, but you don't have to specifically ex explicitly uh, specify. And one of the other things that you can do, I'm not sure if anybody, uh, if most of you are aware of the ternary operator, which is the question mark uh, colon operator you would normally use in these cases in Java. Now, Kotlin doesn't have the equivalent, but it does allow you to shorthand uh, this uh, if statement. If you only have one statement per branch, you can write it like this. So in the end, you can write a function like that as a one line. I think that's quite nice. You can, you can save on real estate, and it's easy to reason about this function. It takes a boolean, it checks if this boolean is a certain value, and returns it. So that's quite nice. So if I were to print this, then hopefully behavior would still be the same. <coughs> Comma. Probably because I closed it, I guess. Still yes, very nice. And one of the last things I wanted to show you is that uh, if you were to further optimize this, right, wouldn't it be cool that you could call this directly on the Boolean uh, function, on, on the class, on the type? Uh, so what, what if I were to say I uh, have a, let's say, class super Boolean, and I'm extending the Boolean type. And I'm going to add a function that does this to it. This is interesting. Yeah. Ignore that. So what's happening here is that this can't happen. And why not? Because Boolean is final. So you can't extend this type. So you could do something like wrap it. I don't uh, recommend that generally. But Kotlin has a nice feature, which is an extension function. So I could write this as an extension function. And to do that, I just say, OK, I want to have this function. Let's say I call it two years now to shorten it a little bit. And I want to bind to a Boolean. So I specify the function as boolean dot to just now, to yes now. Then I can remove this parameter. I don't need it anymore because I get the boolean I'm calling this on passed in as a parameter, which is accessible with the this keyword. So it's already a lot more compact than it was before. And right now when I do this, I can just remove this and I can now simply type to yes now. And this is all right. I can call it on the Boolean function now. And what have I done? I haven't actually extended the, the, the uh, Boolean, because that's not possible. The class is still final. Kotlin doesn't do any bytecode magic. What Kotlin does for you is they make it possible to actually write the final wrapper function. So what happens is this is just a little bit of magic. In the end, this just returns into a static function that takes the Boolean as a parameter, but it's abstracted away from you. So this is, this is just syntactic sure, not more, no less. And one of the nice things about this, because it's not uh, actually operating or on bytecode or op operating on actual instances, we can actually specify that this is going to be null safe. So we could actually call this on a Boolean, if I specify it like this. And we're going to say this Boolean has a null value at this point, and I'm going to call this. This does not throw a compile error, because I'm saying this is an extension function for a nullable Boolean type. Now, for this, I have to take into account that the, this can be null at this point. So let's say if it's not null, and if it's true, then I expect yes, and otherwise I expect no. And now I can actually call this on a null type without getting null point exceptions. And I think this is one of the examples that really shows the value of, of, of yeah, the concise code and, and, and proper tool set. So like you can see, value is null, and it returns null. No no pointers, no nothing. So that's basically all I have for now. And normally I spend an hour doing this live coding, so uh, uh, I hope I, this is not too light for you. Uh, if you're interested in it, if, if this makes you excited, then I should uh, suggest you come to the Java uh, uh, part of the, the, <coughs> the cool part of the, <laughs> of the workshop, which is on this side. Uh, you're very welcome, and uh, yeah, let's see uh, if we can build some nice content together. Thank you. Yes, so uh, as said, we have the areas. You can uh, go to your area now. Uh,
What I wanted to ask you guys is to mingle, pair up. Uh, the leaflet on the tables, there are the instructions for your workshop. Uh, and these guys will also be presenting. Uh, I would ask you, I'd like to ask you to help each other. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. There are people here who walk around who can help you with your workshop. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, the best questions will get a t-shirt uh, from Joost, from Kotlin Amsterdam. Uh, he has different sizes, ladies, men's, big, small, so uh, go for it. Uh, we also have uh, a lottery in, uh, in during the break where you can win a ladies and a, a men's uh, t-shirt. And uh, we would also really appreciate uh, your feedback. So at the end, or maybe in the break, we have a wall on this side where you can put a sticky with the things you really like or the things you think can be improved. Uh, we really like to hear this because we really uh, like to do uh, good for you guys. Uh, so, uh, time for the workshops. Thank you. Thank you.